we are sri lanka's only neighbor shoma we are sri lanka's only neighbor every breath they take uh, is connected with india now look at the situation now, where are the chinese uh, seen uh, they're not anywhere the chinese just don't know how to deal with crises of this nature the chinese you know really don't know how democracy works i don't think they move very closely in circles you know when our diplomats are posted in in our in our neighborhood you know the kind of um, knowledge and awareness and in depth kind of understanding that we pick up i don't think the chinese can match that <laughs> Hi, I'm Shoma Chaudhary. Thanks for watching Inquiry. The last couple of weeks has been dominated by the acute political and economic crisis in Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Even as the immediate trigger points subside, there are interesting questions to be asked about what the crises revealed about India's neighbors, the implications for India, and the role of China. To unravel these strands beyond the immediacy of the news, I have on the show today Nirupama Rao. Nirupama is a seasoned diplomat who's been India's ambassador to America, China, and Sri Lanka, and she's also been India's foreign secretary. She recently wrote a book called The Fractured Himalay, which tracks the relations between India and China. Thank you very much for joining me on Inquiry, Ms. Rao. It's a privilege to have you on my show. Thank you so much, Shoma. It's a privilege to be here. So, uh, Ms. Rao, you know, over the last few days, there's been a lot of media attention on the political and economic uh, crisis in Pakistan and Sri Lanka. And curiously, there's also been, you know, very eerie videos of people shouting from, you know, lit buildings in Shanghai. There's been seemingly food riots and people uh, breaking into malls and shops. So there's a great sense of crisis in all the countries surrounding India. So I'm going to look at the implications for India. But first, I wanted to ask you whether you see any common factors uh, in this crisis? You know, is it the personality of the leaders? There's a kind of authoritarianism in all three countries. Uh, you know, there's been economic decisions. And of course, for Pakistan and Sri Lanka, that uh, allegiance to China, do you think that these are connecting dots uh, in this cautionary tale? Uh, well, I really don't think there are connecting dots in all these three tales or stories or narratives. As far as China is concerned, I would still uh, take these reports of food riots and disturbances with a, with a huge dash of salt. Um, it is true that the Chinese government is autocratic, authoritarian, I would say, not just autocratic. And uh, its capacity for crisis management, we have still to see. It hasn't really been tested. Um, in the case of Shanghai, it's a city under lockdown. Obviously, administrative arrangements and supplies and the supply chain hasn't worked very well. Uh, but I think we'll have to wait and see how that situation develops. In the case of uh, Pakistan and Sri Lanka, again, they're not exactly mirror images of each other, but they're two South Asian countries. And to that extent, you know, we are more familiar with situations there. And we've seen uh, much of this crisis, crisis in each country brewing over the last few months and certainly over the last few weeks. Where, uh, how the two leaders, uh, are the two leaders, I mean, each sets of leaders in each of these countries, uh, do they kind of mirror each other? Again, I would say no. In the case of Sri Lanka, a country with which I have, in which I've lived and dealt with extensively, uh, the Rajapaksas are a, uh, are a clan that has been in politics for a long time. They, Mahinda Rajapaksa won the civil war, literally won the civil war, and he enjoys a great following in the country for that reason. He's seen a, as a kind of liberator as far as the majority community is concerned. But his uh, brother, uh, Gotabaya, who has an army background and who's been president over the last few years, he's become the fall guy in all this, I think, because the policies of his government are seen as having uh, betrayed the national, uh, the cause of the welfare of the people of Sri Lanka. And so most of the anger is directed against him. Now, but they're not going away. That's what I wanted to say. In the case of Pakistan, Imran Khan has in a sense gone away, but has he really gone away is the question because you've had the vote of confidence, but he has been threatening to take to the streets. He has a core of uh, very popular support. And, um, and even in the army, I believe that at least the junior officers and certain ranks of the military uh, support him. 
This, so in that sense, the Rajapaksa, especially Gotabaya Rajapaksa and Imran Khan, uh, you know, they are they are populist leaders. They have followed populist measures. Gotabaya, for instance, cut taxes. It was a populist measure. But Sri Lanka has been in a bad shape economically for more time than his tenure. You know, it, it's been a crisis waiting to happen over the last uh, decade, at least seven to eight years. And in the case of Pakistan, it's been a center for instability in the sense it's been exposed to a lot of happenings over the last few years. And it's been at the crossroads, literally, uh, of um, uh, developments uh, stemming out of Afghanistan, some of it of uh, Pakistan's own making, the very tenuous nature of democracy in that country, the yes. fact that it's such a diffuse country, various provinces seem to be at loggerheads with each other. So uh, Pakistan, of course, is a much larger country than Sri Lanka. Yeah. You know, Sri Lanka is tiny compared to that. So, you know, if you just focus on uh, Sri Lanka uh, for the moment, because, you know, in Pakistan with the no confidence uh, motion having gone through, there's a momentary hiatus uh, over there, you know, before things develop further. And I'd like to look at the implications for India. But coming to Sri Lanka, you know, when you said that the Rajapaksas had popular support, it's this economic collapse, you know, where there's literally no diesel, no electricity, food, even the well healed are finding it hard to access food. That kind of quick economic collapse, uh, would you not lay it overall at the Rajapaksa's doors? Because at least so, since the 2000s, by and large, it's been their family that's been in power. Uh, you know, for a brief moment in between, there was Sirisena, but, uh, you know, and they've been posing up to uh, China, they've been taking debts, they've, you know, there's the famous uh, Hamanbota uh, uh, port, as well as the, the Colombo port. So, like, like I said, is it that their um, leaning towards China has brought on this? Or is it other factors? It's much more than the leaning towards China, although I know in India we would like to see it that way. It gives us some comfort. You know, it's an aha moment. Look, this is what the Chinese have done. Ultimately, sovereign governments take, you know, decisions in a sovereign manner. And I don't question the sovereignty of the Sri Lankan government or its ability to take decisions. It is, you know, the Rajapaksas come out of the south of Sri Lanka. It's literally the heartland, the Singhala heartland. And they have played to populism over the years. I mean, it's you look at Hambantota, they gave it to the Chinese, but that whole area seeking to develop it, uh, you know, to uh, subsidize uh, various supplies to, uh, to, uh, to the people, uh, you know, to, to be rather careless about fiscal policy. And uh, generally, you know, just the way the country has been run, there has been no financial sobriety, I think, when it comes to uh, how uh, to recognize the warning signals and to take corrective measures. They've had two, uh, you know, lines uh, from IMF, uh, sort of almost like, you know, you could call it bailout, but certainly, um, you know, funds being infused from the IMF since the, since the civil war ended. And now uh, on the 18th, I think their team led by the finance minister will be in uh, Washington to negotiate another IMF line, uh, which, which will come with a lot of conditionalities, no doubt. So to answer your question, there's no pain ahead for Sri Lanka. It's not that, you know, of course, our line of uh, credit from uh, India it's not that we are doling out money to Sri Lanka, and I don't think we, we should be doing that. The point is we have come to the help. We've been first responders as far as uh, the troubles of that country are concerned. And our line of credit has, has you know, uh, enabled the supply of food, grain, uh, diesel. Diesel has been a critical supply from India, and I think at least for the next one month or so, it should tide over their difficulties. So already, if you uh, if you if you know seen the latest videos and images are coming out of the country. The, the crowds are less on the streets. Obviously, you know, supplies are coming in again. And, uh, you know, some of the needs of the people are being assuaged uh, thanks to, to what India is doing. Uh, so uh, 
we, we haven't been, you know, drumming that from the rooftops, but our help has been critical for that country in, in, at this time of need. And in the north of the country, of course, in Jaffna and other places, uh, you have a population that has endured great hardship through the civil war. So in, a, in many ways, they are inured, you know, to, to hardship and difficulties. They're managing the best they can. But friends who live there also tell me how hard life has become. So, you know, India has been uh, mature in the way it's uh, done humanitarian, uh, you know, uh, interventions in Afghanistan and Sri Lanka, rather than wading into political crises or military crises. Uh, so, you know, that's good on us. But do you think that there's been a kind of gap which India should fix now using this opportunity where, uh, you know, I was reading these statistics, you will know better that uh, around 2005, uh, China was only 1% of Sri Lanka's development assistance, you know, and today it's overtaken India and Japan put together, it's at some 23%. It's the second largest, uh, uh, you know, commercial uh, sort of trade dealer. It's the largest lender. And India has kept very little footprint uh, in Sri Lanka. So do you think that there's some rectification of focus that should happen using this opportunity? Uh, you know, Shuma, of course, the Chinese uh, dole out money. They they have this dollar diplomacy, literally, or yuan diplomacy, one can call it. And they're very well healed. There's no doubt about it. But everything that has been given to Sri Lanka has been given, you know, at high interest rates. It's not like, you know, they've... Yeah, it's like a loose was, Yeah, it's not like arms have been given, you know. So they have to repay everything. So that the burden on Sri Lanka has grown tremendously and uh, a, a good proportion, not in the entire, uh, you know, lot of it, but a good proportion of it is really all the debt owed to China. So I think the people sense that. The second point I'd like to make is that over the recent past, at least over the last few months, you've seen that the Rajapaksas have drawn closer to India. And I think there's a little more willingness, a little more sensitivity uh, to listening to us and uh, to, you know, to uh, our counsel or whatever good advice we can give them. They have been, and, and number of projects have been recently allotted to India by the Rajapaksas. And that hasn't entirely pleased the Chinese. I think you've seen a lot of that wolf warrior diplomacy in full, uh, you know, uh, display in Sri Lanka, uh, as far as the Chinese are concerned. So I wouldn't say that, you know, our imprint has, is very little. You know, we are Sri Lanka's only neighbor, Shoma. We are Sri Lanka's only neighbor, every breath they take uh, is connected with India. So I certainly refute the, the statement that our imprint is very, very, so very little, very uh, limited in, in Sri Lanka. Now look at the situation, where are the Chinese uh, seen? Uh, they're not anywhere. The Chinese just don't know how to deal with crises of this nature. I think, uh, you know, when it, whether it's the tsunami, whether it was, you know, uh, during the civil war, whatever, you know, uh, we did in terms of ensuring that the unity and sovereignty of Sri Lanka was not in any way diluted. I think that those connections they amount to a lot. They amount to a lot. It's not to be measured in dollars or yuan or projects that have come up. It's just the fact that, you know, um, in a sense, the, the, the uh, people, the, the history, the geography, and in many ways, the socio-political um, structure of Sri Lanka is so closely knit with India. So, you know, this thing about authoritarianism, it's, uh, it's a concern now actually globally, you know, where there's a great move towards authoritarianism, even in traditionally democratic societies. Do you see that as the big Achilles heel of the Rajapaksas? You know, the, the fact that they've been really repressive of the press, they withdrew from the human rights resolution, you know, they've been releasing war criminals. Uh, again, you'll know better, but reading from the news, apparently, uh, Gota Rajapaksa had uh, turned over almost 37 agencies under military control, uh, you know, so like really centralizing power and then their families, of course, uh, you know, like in every key position, it's their family. So when you shut out dialogue and democratic dissent and not, you know, is when a crisis actually just grows because you're in a soundproof room. Do you see that as being a big fault line within Sri Lanka now? 
I think the fault line in Sri Lanka now essentially is the economic crisis. The fact that financial and economic management has been so poor, investment has dried up. Of course, you had a number of factors that also contributed to the economic meltdown. And authoritarianism is not one of them. Let me tell you that. It's not, because the fact is that, you know, um, uh, the economy had been in a kind of black backslide uh, over the last decade or so. And then tourism earnings, which is a huge, uh, you know, source of earnings for Sri Lanka, had dried up after the Easter uh, bombings in 2019. And uh, the pandemic has caused a lot of problems everywhere, all around the world. So there's been economic slowdown because of that. Remittances have slowed down from the Gulf. The number of Sri Lankans like the Indians. We have a, they have a number of uh, expatriate workers there and remittances are a big source of foreign exchange earnings. All that has been reduced over, over the last uh, few years. So today when people are saying, um, you know, of course you do see slogans referring to uh, human rights and other things, but the basic thrust is the fact that People have been used to, you know, certain comforts, certain supplies, certain, you know, a certain order in their lives. And that has disappeared. Now, authoritarianism, uh, authoritarianism, autocracy does not disturb social order in that sense. What disturbs social order is when these sort of things happen. So uh, supplies are limited and commodities are not available, foreign trade, you know, they just, it's just that um, uh, they're in a crisis because of, poor management, you know, poor economic management. Yeah, I was just making that linkage that if, when, when you move towards authoritarianism, then there isn't debate and discussion. You're not listening because you can take unilateral decisions, you know, and because you shut out debate, uh, it leads to poor economic decision making as well. That is, of course, that is all obviously true. That's a generic uh, truth that you can apply to many such situations like this. But if you're asking me, uh, does this, you know, you talked about what India can do. Now, India is not in the business of regime change. I can tell you that. So if the Rajapaksas are democratically elected leaders of Sri Lanka, it's a question of what the popular choice has been, what has been. And they still, I mean, you know, it's an executive presidency. You have to, you know, there has to be a discussion and moves within Sri Lankan parliament if they have to do away with the 20th Amendment to the constitution that brought in the executive presidency and then the 19th Amendment before that. But all that has to take place within the confines of uh, debate, political and constitutional parliamentary debate within Sri Lanka. It's not going to happen from outside. So no. as I was talking to somebody today, the Rajapaksas are not going away. You know, there's been a lot of uh, speculation, a lot of reports proliferating that, you know, they will have to leave the country and, you know, this is the end of the yeah, there is, I don't think that is going to happen. That is not, uh, you know, we have to disabuse ourselves of that kind of, uh, you know, prognosis or prognostications. And neither is the opposition in within Sri Lanka. You know, they keep saying they will have a lot of strength to, you know, to overturn this government. That has also not happened. They still, I think the, uh, the president has about 134 members of parliament from his party still there. So they have a simple majority. I mean, they have a, the majority, the largest majority in parliament. Let's put it there. Some others have defect, not defected, but they're sitting on the fence. So the opposition really does not have a uniform, united, consolidated strategy either to deal with this, which really uh, means that uh, let's deal with the economic crisis and uh, and uh, lessen and limit the difficulties faced by the people. That is really what they're facing at the moment. So we'll move away to Pakistan, just one or two last questions, which is that, uh, you know, th there's been a lot of focus on the fact that uh, Tamilians and Sinhalese uh, have come together in the protests, you know, and that there's a younger generation that seems to not have that kind of entrenched adversarial hatred of each other. Do you think that that also too much is being made of? Or do you think that that could potentially be a new, uh, you know, like what is shared in Sri Lanka's politics? I really can't uh, really answer that question with, a, with an unqualified yes. 
I would say, of course, among the university associations within Sri Lanka, students have, you know, there have been demonstrations in universities, very little in the north, I would say, in the Tamil uh, majority areas in the north, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that. As to, in terms of, you know, the two ethnic communities, uh, and they're called in Sri Lanka races, but they're not really two different races, they're basically uh, quite, quite similar. In terms of the two communities or two ethnic groups coming together, I think, you know, um, uh, politicians, Tamil politicians, Sri Lankan Tamil politicians are still looking for devolution, they're looking for decentralization, their, uh, their asks after the civil war uh, continue to be that the north and east of the country where the Tamils are mainly situated need to have that kind of voice uh, in in governance, you know, in local administration and uh, decentralization, basically. So those uh, asks and those aspirations continue to be there. It's just that because of the economic crisis, there is this impression that everybody has come together because everybody is hurting similar, yeah, in a similar way. For the first time, perhaps in the independent history of the country, in that sense, you see a kind of closing of ranks. But um, this government, uh, the government in Kalamo, the Rajapaksa government, could I believe have, you know, South Asia has to be all about integration. And that is uh, where India is concerned with our neighbors and also where our neighbors are concerned with India. Now, we have been advocating for the longest time that connectivity between northern part of Sri Lanka in terms of ferry services, in terms of air lanes. You see Palali Airport in Jaffna, yeah, I remember the runway of Palali Airport had been uh, extended to for civilian aircraft for, during the time I was High Commissioner there. But we still don't have civilian flights operating out of Jaffna to India, to Peninsula India, and vice versa. Uh, the the Kankes and Turai Harbour, which is one of the main harbours in the Northern Peninsula, you know, it could have received, in, especially at times like this, supplies from India because we are just a hair, you know, just a hair's breadth away in terms of contiguity. So that kind of, you know, crises like this also tell you a little about how unintegrated we are as a region. Uh, things have to be flown into Colombo and then they have to take the eight hour ride up to Jaffna or, you know, to Trincomalee. And then the other thing we must watch out about, although this is, please don't think I'm trying to be alarmist, but in times of crisis, we've always had refugee inflows from Sri Lanka. And I heard today from a friend in Chennai, I think about uh, 10 or 20, uh, you know, people came across my boat from Trincomalee into Tamil Nadu. So that is also, so we cannot, in that sense, we are, we cannot divorce ourselves, certainly from what is happening in Sri Lanka. And uh, it is in our interest to see stability and um, uh, the economic crisis attended to as soon as possible. So, you know, you were saying that there's uh, like, it, it, helps or makes India feel good uh, to say that China's hand is uh, souring in the region, you know. But uh, I just want to press that point again, that whether it was with Nepal or Bhutan, Sri Lanka, you know, for a while, there was great disenchantment with India and there was a great movement towards China. Do you think that some, because of these, you know, crises just sputtering everywhere, that uh, there is at least some of the sheen of Chinese help uh, and Chinese money would, would have uh, diminished now after this. Well said, well, and Bhutan anyway has been, you know, the closest of our, of our friends. So I wouldn't put Bhutan in that category. Although, yes, China has been yes. breathing down Bhutan's neck, I would say, put it that way. But yes, as far as Nepal is concerned, and now, of course, uh, with the crisis in Sri Lanka, I think, yes, this has been a kind of uh, a rite of initiation, let's say, for both these countries. Uh, Nepal, not so much because they're not facing this kind of crisis, but certainly I, I think uh, the developments over the last two, three years have also taught the Nepalese uh, some uh, some hard lessons uh, without, you know, I don't want to pontificate as an Indian where that is concerned, but certainly I think, um, you know, the, the, the uh, challenge for many of our neighbors, our smaller neighbors, is how to balance China and India off against each other in order to further their, their own interests and their aspirations. So that will continue. I think we should be prepared for that. That kind of a balancing game is not going away. But I think what crises like these teach our neighbors like in Sri Lanka is that not only is India the first responder, that the kind of assistance that is always 
forthcoming from us uh, does help them, you know, in times of crises like this. And uh, and uh, that kind of uh, recognition, I'm sure, is there, is internalized within the people, especially now. But uh, on our side, I think uh, we should uh, be able to, uh, in a sense, build on this kind of uh, positivity that is being generated in order to further uh, the bilateral relationships that we have with these countries and also to see that, uh, you know, the interests of both sides are mutually served through yes. this. So, uh, you know, let me just come to Pakistan now that uh, there's, you know, like you were correcting some of the kind of just easy formulations that are happening about Sri Lanka, uh, where uh, Imran Khan is uh, concerned. You know, there's been a lot of talk that, uh, you know, there was this conflict with the army, uh, that he was moving away from America towards China and Russia. So the first uh, sort of thing I wanted you to speak on is that, are those formulations correct? Because, you know, he was pretty much brought in by the army. So if he was leaning towards China and Russia and mouthing anti-American slogans, would he at all have been in a position to do that independently? Or was that something that the Pakistani army would have themselves wanted? I really... I, now, of course you can, I mean, it's your analysis. I'm not yeah, asking for a definitive... And as far as Imran Khan is concerned, I think he is... Uh, uh, he, he is a, 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 a unique pers personality in that sense. I mean, he um, marches to the sound of his own drum. I don't believe he is. Uh, he wants to tie himself to any uh, mentor or any, um, you know, uh, protector or patron. And that applies even to China. I mean, I don't think the Chinese are entirely happy with Imran Khan either. And they would probably favor somebody like Shabazz, a Sharif, who is supposed to be a go-getter, a doer, a good administrator. So the Chinese, you know, really don't know how democracy works. I don't think they move very closely in circles. You know, when our diplomats are posted in, in, our, in our neighborhood, you know, the kind of um, knowledge and awareness and in-depth kind of understanding that we pick up, I don't think the Chinese can match that. In that sense, also, I think we do better. Uh, than, than the Chinese. So as far as I don't even know if the Chinese really have built any close relationship with, with Imran Khan. On the, uh, in fact, personal relationships are something that they don't really build up because that's the way their system is. It is a closed system. It's very um, doctrinaire. It's very, uh, you know, everything is leveraged out of Beijing. Uh, it's so scripted. So in that kind of familiarity, the Chinese never develop in, in, our, in our region. But Imran Khan, coming back to Imran Khan, you know, he is capable of whipping up uh, a mob. You know, he'll just do uh, what he wants. In that sense, he's, you know, he's, he's not very controllable, let us say, whether it's by the army or whether it's by his own political party. Uh, he has his, his core group of supporters and uh, he remains quite popular in sections within Pakistan. So you can't entirely write him off. So today, I mean, uh, they say, Mr. Shabash Sharif, I haven't seen the news today, but I suppose it is imminent that they will have a new prime minister and it's most likely to be uh, Shabash Sharif. But, um, and then elections to be announced by the end of the year. Yeah. So you have a period of instability ahead. And what is Imran Khan going to do in this in this period is the question. So uh, more, more than, you know, where he, his, his governance, his record of governance, his, you know, his, uh, his, uh, his methods uh, of, uh, you know, of leading the country or, or governing the country, they're quite unorthodox. Uh, he didn't, he doesn't, he's not a conformist in that sense. So uh, whether that was good for Pakistan, one really doesn't know, but the situation, the economic situation in Pakistan is certainly uh, not good and therefore points to uh, the uh, the shortcomings in governance and Imran Khan's leadership over the last three years. You know, you'd made that point. I mean, of course, uh, you know, Pakistan is seen as a absolutely, you know, it's like a genetic adversary. So, but, you know, I, I was seeing somewhere that you said the best diplomacy is one which really looks at the good of both countries, you know, because that's the one that's sustainable. So just for a moment to focus on Pakistan before we come to implications for India, that, uh, you know, America has sort of used them 
in a very transactional way, you know. And so some of the, like, now that uh, the whole Afghanistan issue has, the center has shifted to Qatar, uh, you know, America quite openly says they don't need Pakistan. Uh, you know, 80,000 civilians in Pakistan were also killed by drone attacks, which is something Imran was raising. So if one just didn't go with the, the mood and was to look at some of the stands that he took, which may have been fair, what are the things that you think he did right? And what we, do you think are literally mistakes that he's made for his own country? Well, I, you know, I haven't studied Imran Khan very closely, I must say, and or his policies over the last three years. But I think, um, uh, you know, uh, as far as uh, you know, his uh, uh, his his the way of uh, you know uh, his dealings with with the rest of the world were concerned. Again, they bore the stamp of being Imran. I think that is the whole, I mean, the whole three last three years can be labeled being Imran. And uh, I don't really know if he did anything uh, very right in the last three years, as far as uh, Pakistan's uh, foreign policy outreach was concerned. Um, you know, he was very miffed with the Americans because he didn't get the kind of recognition he felt he, he deserved for, you know, uh, he felt he was being balanced and, and uh, you know, mature in his approach, but the Americans obviously thought otherwise. I think there was a great, there's been a great deal of dissatisfaction in the United States about the, the role Pakistan played as far as Afghanistan was concerned and the U.S. presence in Afghanistan was concerned. And therefore, now you have, you know, uh, seasoned uh, American analysts and observers. Lisa Curtis was mentioning the other day how, you know, they use Qatar now to deal with Afghanistan. They don't need Pakistan. But, you know, Pakistan can't be written off also by the Americans like that. It is a key uh, country in the region, strategically yeah. important country. So uh, I don't believe uh, an enforced isolation of Pakistan is going to happen as far as uh, America is concerned, and particularly because the Chinese are so active and operate so much within Pakistan. I think the American interest in Pakistan will also continue to be uh, quite, uh, quite, um, uh, what shall I say, uh, noteworthy and uh, and something you can't write off so uh, to where china was concerned i think uh, the chinese uh, and imran as i mentioned didn't have the happiest of relationships and i think on the cpec also uh, they haven't seen the kind of progress they would have liked to see and uh, of course he's been careful not to uh, not to cross certain red lines far, as far as china is concerned particularly as far as the situation in xinjiang is uh, you know and the whole east Pakistan uh, independence movement is concerned so he he's in a sense kept them at bay kept the chinese at bay uh, his outreach to russia of course raised a lot of eyebrows in in america and uh, so to answer your question did he really do everything right no, well, not anything. I was, I was asking, was there... No, did he do anything in the sense, <laughs> you know? But the fact is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, nationalism and populism, they make a heady cocktail in many countries today. And uh, as far as the Pakistani uh, sections of the Pakistani population were concerned, they see him as trying to uh, build a profile for Pakistan that is somewhat, uh, that wants to make Pakistan's voice heard in the world. And uh, and uh, some of the things he talks about, you know, he's been praising our India lately, and you said you want to come to India later yeah. but uh, i think he really deep down wants to carve out for pakistan that kind of an image uh, you know where they're not talked the down of us yeah uh, yeah where they're not talked down not the western countries don't come to them and say do this do that you know and but the fact is pakistan is so much in debt uh, to the rest of the world financially economically and uh, so uh, you know, if he had the aspirations that Pakistan should learn to stand on its own feet, I don't think we can fault him for that. And many Pakistanis would not, but he did not really succeed. So in that sense, his his uh, record of governance, uh, both internally and externally, really didn't amount to, uh, to a great uh, chapter in Pakistan's history. Right. So, uh, you know, just implications for India. There's again been a lot of analysis that uh, Shabaz Sharif com coming into power and potentially, you know, it's their party that will win the election as well. The coalitions, uh, the opposition parties coming together. 
you know, even General Bajwa saying that he's ready to move forward for talks with India. Uh, again, you know, how much weightage would you give this? Is there, do you think there's going to be any uh, sort of new space for positivity? Uh, will there be any resumption of dialogue? Have the Sharifs had any uh, steadiness in their approach to India? You know, uh, how do you read the fallout uh, from an Indian perspective? Well, the Sharifs have a lot of business interests, I think. Uh, uh, I mean, with India, in a sense, uh, a lot, uh, you know, they are uh, their business family and they obviously uh, see some advantage in opening, uh, you know, channels with India. But if you're asking me of uh, what, it, whether, you know, the Sharif's coming back uh, to, to power, it, this is a temporary development. One really doesn't know if this is going to be, uh, you know, something that will endure. So um, my uh, uh, prognosis is that uh, there, is, uh, there is going to be instability in Pakistan. And uh, so when you have that kind of instability, you really can't transact, you know, uh, neighborhood diplomacy with any great degree of success. That's not going to happen. The fact is that uh, over the last year, uh, the Pakistanis have been relatively restrained, I think, as far as in, in the, you know, you saw that with the, with the, with the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, missile firing that went yeah. awry. Uh, their reaction was uh, was pretty much restrained, and I think uh, we need we need to take that on record. I mean, we haven't said very much about it, but it is something that uh, would be would have been observed not just within India but all around the world. The ceasefire is held uh, on the line, on the line of control and on the border, international border, for the for the for more than a year now. These are you know good developments. They need to be continued. But if you're asking me whether you know now the army, uh, the establishment, as the Pakistanis call them, uh, within Pakistan, will now be open. Uh, you know, they make pronouncements, they make statements to the effect that they would like better relations with. With India, but how does that all translate into real diplomacy? Is the question. I think um, the whole uh, Kashmir issue constantly surfaces any time you talk to them. And as far as India is concerned, I think at the popular level, at the level of the people, at the level of you know um, uh, important uh, vectors of public opinion and uh, opinion makers. I think this whole issue of the, of terrorism emanating from Pakistan has not gone away. That continues and that continues to be, uh, you know, an issue of great concern for us and something about which we need to be constantly alert to and aware of. So, and then there is Pakistan's China relationship. You know, given the fact that our own relations with China have uh, have deteriorated you know, over the last two years since Galwan. Uh, so all that makes for a for a mix that would call, I think, for very very sober assessments about, uh, you know, any opening in India-Pakistan relations. Ideally, yes, you may argue you need commerce, especially trade. I think yeah. between the two countries should be open, uh, and um, uh, we need at least some channels of communication to be established. But you know, if you're talking somebody the other, I think it was. Mushayed Hussein, who was talking the other day of cricket, commerce, and culture. Uh, maybe of the three C's, commerce, but even that uh, in the present circumstances seems very, uh, very difficult to envisage. Uh, and as I said, uh, this instability within Pakistan and the fact that Pakistan has to deal with its own internal problems over the in the near and midterm, I think would suggest that you should not uh, hope against hope for openings in India-Pakistan relations. Right. So just last two questions. One is that this economic instability, uh, you know, and this level of uh, political instability in Pakistan is not good news for India as well, because, you know, so much of unrest and then leaders are tempted to create other kinds of distraction. Uh, so, you know, speaking for Pakistan itself, there's this sense now that the no confidence motion, the judicial intervention, the Supreme Court insisting uh, that the National Assembly be reconvened, all of that is being seen as, a, you know, like as a great step for democracy in Pakistan. But I again wanted your perspective on that, that do you think it was a step for democracy or is that again just the army 
you know, it's army's ven ventriloquism that they're now using the instruments of state. They wanted Imran Khan gone and they've used uh, the political wings of the state to get what they wanted. So is this good for democracy or is it again just the army flexing its muscles? Uh, given the situation in today's Pakistan and the kind of chaos and, and unrest you've seen there, I think even the army, you know, cannot be that god in the machine. I think even they would like to, they, at least they would suggest that they've distanced themselves a little from what uh, what is happening. The second point is even if they were to intervene and, you know, on if you go by Pakistan's past history, I don't think that is an outcome that is some that is something we can realistically envisage because of the... No, I wasn't talking about whether there's going to be an army coup. I was asking you this particular... No, I know. I'm not saying there will be an army coup, but is the army kind of directing this from behind the curtain? I mean, I, if I brought you... Yes. I, I mean, I really, I don't know if the army is directing directing this from behind the curtain, certainly what has been in evidence is a degree of uh, very strong disillusionment with Imran Khan, who started out as a, you know, the army and he were very much on the same wavelength. So um, uh, what it, to me, as, as an observer, what it would suggest is that in today's Pakistan, it's, it's even, it's difficult even for the army to kind of uh, play that savior you know, that uh, or this kind of def defender of, you know, well, the well-being of the well, welfare. Well, and savior in inverted quotes. You know. <laughs> and the savior in, in inverted quotes, certainly. They, they can't be that. I don't believe they can. And the uh, political developments, which you saw over the last uh, few days, I think really played out within uh, the the political space in, in, in Pakistan. Of course, I think, uh, you know, the even the army, must have been must have heaved a sigh of relief with the with the uh, vote of confidence uh, the outcome of the vote of confidence but as i said earlier the problems haven't gone away and and the army has not been able to solve those problems in the, you know they've not the unrest the kind of uh, the instability that comes out of the street within pakistan and the fact that um, uh, leaders like imran khan can um, can rally uh, a lot of support from out of the street and uh, this is something that uh, that uh, that would point to a country where it's not the evolution of democracy that has that has uh, come to to realize all this but the fact that yes the space for political uh, parties has expanded within uh, within Pakistan over the last uh, few years and in the last decade or so. But also coming with that, there is a lot of infighting within that political space that is taking place. And uh, it, it is probably reaching levels which become e even for an army, which has been traditionally involved in the running of the affairs of state within that country, uh, it becomes even for the army quite difficult to control, which doesn't uh, doesn't give you a good prognosis for the country. Right. So just last question, you know, we spoke about uh, these countries becoming wary of China and, you know, the kind of uh, the noose, you know, the debt trap uh, diplomacy that they use. But do you think, you know, you've been a great, uh, you've been posted in China. I mean, you've read, you've been watching China for many, many years. How do you read them? You know, like I was also posted there. I was yes, also yes. posted. You were. You were the only woman ambassador to China. But I was saying that you've also been, uh, uh, you know, analyzing China for years before you even became the ambassador there. That uh, how do you read their reaction to this level of political chaos? You know, it's interesting that they didn't wade into the Russian question with any real clarity. Um, you know, how do you read them? Like America is adept at dealing with political, uh, you know, I wouldn't say adept positively or negatively, but they know how to be in those situations. What about China? Do you think they are having a reverse reaction that they don't want this kind of uh, chaos? They don't know how to deal with it? The Chinese, as I said, when it comes to crisis management of the sort, we tend to uh, do quite uh, quite ably in, in South Asia and particularly in India. They're very ill-equipped for that. Uh, of course, it's an autocratic, authoritarian uh, regime, a one-party state in China. 
And uh, the way the mechanisms of the state apparatus work, uh, speak autocracy in every word and every act. But um, when they see, are witness to the kind of political infighting and falling out and collapse of governments that we uh, have seen, you know, in our neighborhood, I think that they are not equipped really uh, to, uh, to respond to this in any manner that would suggest an activist Chinese diplomacy that is working for stability, that is working for consensus building, that is working to bridge differences. They, they, they really, uh, you know, uh, could, they need to do uh, a lot of learning on that, on that front. And that is not going to happen given the system and the structures within China. So, you know, that was the, that, that gives a very interesting insight then that what is the point of their expansionism and their interventions in so many countries? Because unlike everything we are discussing, it's not like they're trying to uh, create any cultural imprint in the countries in which they uh, are there, you know? So is it just a commercial ambition? Even for strategic purposes, typically it's there if you want to put your worldview into different parts of the globe, you know? Uh, and the, so how do you read, what is the motivating impulse of their expansionism across the world? I think there is a lot of hubris. Uh, there is a, a lot of ambition. Uh, they have the resources to kind of uh, fuel those ambitions and uh, take them along. Uh, they want to see China's profile raised in the world. They want recognition. Uh, they want adulation. Uh, they like patron-client relationships. They, they don't go abroad really to make friends when they use the word friendship. I think there is a hollow and empty ring to it. But they would like that. They would like to disperse patronage because it helps them. And you talked about st strategy. Uh, strategic interests, uh, commercial interests, and cultural interests. They'd like to further all these three. They have strategic, in, they so-called strategic interests in the region. They have very, very uh, tangible commercial interests. Um, they are, you know, hardcore commercial people, material people. And uh, Chinese culture, they'd like to use Chinese culture and language uh, like the Russians would, would do. The Russians don't have that economic heft and uh, but they certainly have strategic interests and uh, Russian culture and language, of course, is a huge vector of Russian identity. So similarly for the Chinese, so they would like certainly to disseminate on all, uh, you know, their in, or protect their interests, leverage their interests on all these three fronts. But to what extent they're able to uh, to sustain that kind of um, ambition? Uh, especially now, since you know they've come up against American opposition in our region, and uh, there are countries such as ours who also understand the nature of the Chinese threat. Uh, I mean, even within ASEAN, though it's less articulated and less kind of vocalized as perhaps we do, I think there is apprehension and there is a certain wariness about Chinese actions and their intentions and ambitions in our region. And just the final note, you think that India has been managing its, uh, you know, its own interests and playing the foreign policy field correctly. What, what do you think we've done right? And what are some things that you might, from your perspective, want done differently or different areas of focus? I think it's an enormously complicated and complex world situation that we face today. And it's not just the pandemic, but even with the rise of China, and the fact that it's a polycentric kind of world that you're seeing. Of course, America continues to be the most powerful country in the world. But today, for instance, with the situation in Ukraine, America's uh, attention and much of its energies now are going to be Europe focused. I mean, the, you know, the Ukraine situation is extremely serious and we don't know what the long term implications will be for Europe and for uh, uh, Western power in that, uh, you know, the whole, uh, the concert of uh, Western power that America seeks to lead, the implications of uh, the Ukraine situation on that, uh, we still cannot completely assess. And um, the, the rise of China, especially in our region, the fact that China and India have this contested border and the situation in Ladakh is not being resolved. So it's a very complex situation in which we have to balance uh, our interests 
very judiciously, very carefully. And I think that uh, the Ministry of External Affairs and the Foreign Minister are uh, doing what they can, uh, the best they can in this situation. Uh, there's been a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, perhaps uh, misgivings now being expressed of, uh, in the West, particularly, yeah. about the kind of stance we've taken on Russia and in Ukraine. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, we've made it very clear that uh, we are for uh, the respect for international law, the UN Charter, for territorial integrity and sovereignty. Uh, we, want, uh, we are not for the creation of a humanitarian crisis as we've seen in Ukraine. But we also you know, have seen through the glass with an awareness that the West took certain steps uh, that in a sense uh, could were deemed by Russia as provocative and in a sense made the situation even more complicated, apart from the fact that Russia has this certain has a certain outlook on Ukraine, which is so much tied up in Russian history, Russian culture and language and uh, Russia's strategic interests in the region. So I think uh, India, where we are, situated where we are, have, has come to realize how complex these situations are and they, there is no real black and white, no real you know, uh, right or wrong you know, that can be clearly defined in this situation. So perhaps we don't have that kind of, um, uh, like you know, the uh, Protestant Christian view of the world, where you know you have heaven and hell, and you have you know right and wrong, very clearly de delineated. Our entire civilizational outlook is so different. Our cultural assimilation, assimilativeness, our ability to uh, to uh, to be balancers. I think that is really India's forte. And I believe if we are able to structure a foreign policy that is able to express that inner identity that we have, that essential innate character that we uh, we are, uh, we stand for as a country, I think we are on the right track. But it's not an easy situation. It's extremely complex. It has implications for our economic well-being. Uh, and you know the welfare of our people, and uh, one cannot fault the government for trying to do its best to ensure that our interests as a nation, which is what we are all here to serve, literally, we want our interests served, and I think our interests are being served. And I believe countries like the United States, even though you know voices from uh, the amphitheater may occasionally suggest that they are they are little, uh, you know, they, they really can't understand some of the actions we have taken. I think uh, government to government, experts to experts, I think people do understand. But we have our task cut out for ourselves, and particularly in, in countries like the United States, being able to, uh, to educate public opinion there about where we are coming from. That we are not, you know, we're not essentially following a kind of a, a, a non-aligned, you know, uh, uh, Ten Commandments, as it were. It's not. We're not doing that. We are. We are a country that is aware of the cyclical changes that have taken place in global affairs, especially over the last thirty years. We are a country that has adjusted to those changes, and uh, we're a country whose power has grown economically and politically on the global stage. And I think India is recognized as that kind of a presence. And, uh, you know, it's in our interest to, uh, to ensure that the track we follow uh, reinforces our ambitions to become that great power. Right. Well, that's a hopeful note to end on, uh, you know, especially when you see this, like you said, this in, a lot of instability around us that in contrast, though uh, PTR Thyagaraj and Tamil Nadu finance minister tweeted that India could well be on its way towards a kind of Sri Lankan crisis because of authoritarianism and state capture. But, you know, in contrast, I think the, the, the message we can take is to really hold strong, like you said, to a civilizational ethos of stability and democracy yes. and, you know, a, a much more graded response to the world. Uh, that's absolutely because, yeah because Shoba, we live in a very complex neighborhood we you know where we are situated is not where washington dc is situated or where moscow is situated for that matter we are where we are and we have to literally uh, 
recognize that, be aware of that constantly. That's the kind of, uh, you know, vision awareness we need. Yeah. And the languaging of even taking that complex position right through India's languaging still has been about uh, respect for borders and humanitarian, uh, you know, uh, awareness. So those things at least are still there, you know, you know endorsing violence. Yeah. Absolutely. I think you're looking at a very stable country, you're looking at a democratic society, and, uh, and you're looking at uh, a, a nation, I think, with a great deal of common sense, a great deal of common sense. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we have a lot of self-correcting mechanisms within our democracy. And uh, as, a, as a country, it's a well-managed country, I mean, administratively despite the great diversity and pluralism and uh, just the, the hugeness of this democracy and its diversity, I think we, we managed uh, our country pretty well. Thank you so much. Financial, financial management also. Thank you so much. Uh, there'll be another day to put a spotlight on ourselves internally, but in the context of the neighborhood, there's much to be proud and grateful for. So thank yes. you so much. <laughs> Thank you.